McMahon, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your office in Cambridge University, right here in the UK. You are a postdoctoral research associate specializing in sedimentology and geochemistry, applying these sciences to some of the earliest forms of multicellular life on Earth, the animals of the Cambrian and Ediacaran periods. Well, we'll be traveling way back in time for this interview, well over 500 million years and then some. But what about your earliest years, Will? Did you always have an interest in science, and in particular, our most ancient forms of life? Yeah, thanks very much. It's a, a pleasure to be on the show today. I think, as with many people, my interests in geology really started with a good teacher. I, um, I grew up in South Wales, and my school was uh, in the fortunate position where they actually offered geology as a, as a school subject from 14. Um, and I always liked sort of uh, hiking outdoors and you know outdoor pursuits. And I was you know passively interested in uh, in in rocks and cliffs and fossils at the time. But um, mm. a teacher really captivated my imagination, and one thing led to another, and I found myself at Imperial College London at eighteen, doing a, a degree in geology and then a PhD specialising on the first evolution of uh, plants, as it was at the time. And, you know, a few years later, got involved with some colleagues here at Cambridge who were very interested in the Ediacaran and Earth's first uh, metazoans, Earth's first animals. And the rest is history. I'm still here. I'm still uh, sort of tapping on Earth's ancient windows, trying to tease information out of the rocks and, and learn about our ancient past and our first organisms. Uh, we're very glad that you are. <laughs> Last year, you and your colleagues published new findings on some of the world's earliest animals and how this changes our understanding of that ancient time period known as the Ediacaran, around 600 million years ago. Now, people won't perhaps be familiar with that time period, but they may well have heard of the Cambrian time period and the so-called Cambrian explosion. So just to get some context, can you give us an overview of the Cambrian and why it's so significant? Yes, the uh, the Cambrian is, uh, is is far more well known uh, within the wider community, and actually understanding the Cambrian is incredibly important for scientists like myself who who focus on the Ediacaran because it really does uh, it sets the scene. This idea that in the middle of the Cambrian, uh, you know, there really was an explosion of diverse life forms, really uh, bizarre and curious creatures, some of whom sort of didn't get very far, failed evolutionary experiments, if you like. And others, things like very popular things like trilobites that uh, that most people are very well known of, which of course you know went on and dominated times through the Paleozoic. Um, but the Cambrian is um, is is made famous ideally by um, a few uh, deposits of geology spread around the world. Probably the most iconic is the Burgess Shale in mm. British Columbia in um, Canada, and these uh, deposits have been intensely studied for over a hundred years now and they correlate in part with deposits in places like uh, Wales and England and and were studied by the likes of Charles Darwin. So when it becomes very important for setting our older Ediacaran scene, whilst Darwin was writing up Origin of Species in the 1830s, he had a dilemma, he had a problem which was, you know, all of his evidence that he was uh, finding from the Galapagos and around his travels on the Beagle. Evolution was a very slow, uh, protracted process. And the problem was at the time, the oldest, the oldest fossils known in the record anywhere in the world were Cambrian. And they were specifically uh, middle Cambrian trilobites from places like Powys and Wales. And they're incredibly complicated organisms with compound eyes and segmented bodies that could move and could predate and reproduce. And this didn't make much sense to Darwin. Uh, you know, he has a quote saying, for my theory of evolution to be true, it seems inconceivable that Earth's Precambrian oceans were swarming with life, something to that respect. It was, it was a big problem for him. And, and you know, his caveat was, 
of course, only a very, very minute percentage of Earth's geological record has been studied adequately. I'd argue that's probably still the case today. We have a huge mm. North American and European bias. But it, but it was a big, it was a big issue for Darwin. And the Ediacaran, to an extent, uh, or more specifically, the discovery of fossils in the Ediacaran, resolved this, uh, this conundrum. Unfortunately, a little bit too late for Darwin to, to see and appreciate it. And for anyone who doesn't know, the explosion was more of a radiation that lasted 20, 25 million years. Isn't that right? It's a protracted event, yes, um, or a series of events. Explosion is a term, you know, it sounds like a short period of time. It's short geologically. I mean, yeah. what's 10 million years between friends? <laughs> So, for a long time, there was some confusion in the scientific world as to where these fairly complex animals of the Cambrian actually had sprung from. There were no earlier fossils found anywhere, at least not until the mid-20th century. So, how did this discovery change things? Yes, well, it's actually a, a series of discoveries made uh, across the planet, all between you know, the late 19th century and early 20th century. So the researchers at the time, the geologists, they wouldn't have been aware of what's going on on the other continent. But, uh, but each of these early discoveries really helped, you know, present day researchers have a really holistic global view. Um, so perhaps the most famous and exquisitely preserved Ediacaran macro fossils anywhere in the planet uh, come from a place called Mistaken Point in Newfoundland. Um, it gets the name because it's an incredibly foggy coastline um, and plenty mm. of ships would lose their bearings and, and crash against the rocks. And the sailors, you know, not that they'd have cared at the time, uh, they were actually crashing against rocks which hosted Earth's oldest known uh, macroscopic life. And that remains the case today. We're at about 565 million years old. And they were first um, reported as, as having fossils there by uh, a man called Alcana Biddings in 1872, 1873. What he actually found were these, these little circular structures, which he couldn't explain uh, abiotically in any way. He couldn't see a reason why we'd get these little, they're like little pimples, just preserved on bedding planes in dense assemblages of hundreds and hundreds, you know, in multiple places too. He couldn't think of an abiotic way of, um, of forming them, which, you know, presented a problem because whilst we didn't have an accurate date at the time, we did know that they were considerably lower down in the strata, so older, than Cambrian bearing deposits, um, also from the island of Newfoundland, uh, yeah. which had already been well known and studied. Um, but he stuck to his guns and he said, you know, I think these must be biological. And he gave them the name Aspidella. Now, Asp Aspidella is a term still entrenched in our literature. It's still very important to us. Um, but we now know that these are the, these are the holdfasts. Um, so essentially the bit of the sediment, which a larger organism, a frondose organism, um, which we call Charnia, or Charnia mazenae, um, or Rangia, there's a couple of types, but they'd be like sea pens floating in the water column, uh, upright but anchored to the substrate. And uh, you, know, you have to have exceptional conditions that we can talk about uh, to actually preserve the full fossil. But these sort of anchor points, these holdfasts, um, they preserve far more easily. We often get just the holdfast and not the frond itself. So Billings did a huge amount. You know, he, he called these, these things aspidalis, said they were probably biological. It took another 60, 70 years before the first actual macrofossils, complete ones, were found in Newfoundland. Um, uh, and they were essentially given the name uh, Charnia or Charnia mazenae. Now that's because they have a lot of similarity or they're the same forms as fossils that were discovered closer to home in the 1950s oh, in a yes. place called Charnwood Forest in Leicestershire. And we can actually uh, thank two school children for, for the discovery of, of these fossils. In 1956, a lady called Tina Negus, a schoolgirl, she found a, a, a Charnia fossil, which um, are beautiful, like quilted frondose organisms, about you know 30 centimeters tall, so big macrofossils. 
And she, she liked geology. She was a pretty good geological student. She was only 15, 16 at the time. Um, and she took it to her local geography teacher and said, I've, I, found, I found this fossil in the Precambrian. And he was, you know, well read for the, the learnings of the day, mm. as it were. And the Precambrian couldn't possibly have something so complicated. The Cambrian was the oldest. And he dismissed it. He said, it must be a plant fossil and it must be far younger. And you must be, you must be wrong. And, um, and Tina took it on the chin, unfortunately, which sort of laid the pathway for uh, the following year. Another schoolboy, Roger Mason, he uh, found a similar fossil. There's some debate if it's even the same fossil. And took it to a geology lecturer at Leicester University that happened to be a family friend. Now, he knew the provenance of the sediment he knew this was from the precambrian of, of charmwood and he saw the significance of it so they named the species they named it Ch charnia uh, or the genus charnia after charmwood forest mm -hmm. and mazanai after roger mason the surname of the boy so whilst roger mason gets a lot of the credit we really have to thank two two school children uh you know for these incredibly important discoveries and charnia and mazanai have been found on multiple continents since the other two locations have similar stories but all kicking off about the same time in namibia uh in the 1930s some german soldiers posted out there presumably bored of their sort of daily chores and daily drills went wandering off and were looking at the slabs of rock and um and found interesting surface textures on them which again were marvelously complicated uh, and couldn't possibly be produced abiotically. And they showed them to a, a scientist that was based in the camp who knew a geologist uh, with the surname Gurik, who uh, immediately knew their significance. And he wrote up those findings in, uh, in 1930, 19, between 1930 and 1933. <clears throat> At the same time, almost exactly the same time, over in Australia, so never, you know, constant. All these discoveries being made around the planet, all around the mm. same time. There was a geologist called Reginald Sprigg, really famous geologist, and um, he owned a plot of land where essentially looking for, for minerals, for, for wealth, for, you know, to prosper. But he also found some fossils that now share his name, something called Sprigina, which uh, looks an awful lot like a trilobite, uh, a trilobite yeah. precursor, if you like. Um, and these all came from a, a place called the Edikara Hills, just the local name, the Edikara mm. Hills. Ah. So the discovery of Precambrian fossils there, you know, the name of the location, Edikara, became eponymous. It's what we, we call the Ediacaran period afterwards. So this is the period of geological time that predates the Cambrian and spans from about 635 million years ago to 542, the base of the Cambrian. So we've got all these discoveries. We've got our Canadian examples, our Australian examples, our Namibian examples, and our British examples, and about 20 others around the world. But these, these early findings sculpted the discipline as we know it, and to an extent, uh, solved Darwin's dilemma. So what are some of the animals that lived in this time period? Can we link any of them to the Cambrian? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question, and, and not one that's... Uh, not heavily debated there's a school of thoughts that the ediacaran organisms pass you know beautifully and perfectly into into the cambrian and organisms uh, such as sprugina they do look like sort of proto trilobites you know it's it's, mm. it's not without imagination to say you know a leads to b others uh, there's nothing like them on the planet anymore and there's and there's nothing like them in the Cambrian, so it's been suggested they're just a, a failed evolutionary experiment. You know, we had a go, we tried some things out, it didn't work. You know, we went dormant and then we came back in the Cambrian explosion. So, so there's there's the two school of thoughts. But I guess to to really try and uh, uh, understand the organisms, um, we need to know, you know, the environments they uh, they they come from and and how they changed throughout the Ediacaran because you know. We had the we had these discoveries from different continents, Australia, Australia, mm. um, Canada, and Namibia, and now that we've sort of been able to look and study all of them, we can actually split them uh, into different assemblages of Ediacaran macrobiota that all have different characters, different traits. 
So our examples from the United Kingdom, from Leicestershire, uh, and our examples from, from Newfoundland, Mistaken Point, um, they are the oldest, um, but they're also the deepest uh, water. Uh, you know, they're preserved in rocks that we think formed as turbidity currents or submarine flows cascading out into very, very deep uh, waters. And actually, this is one of the reasons why we, we suspect or knew initially that these were metazoans, these were animals and not uh, phototrophs or things that would uh, need sunlight for energy because there wouldn't have been any sunlight. Uh, these sediments, they were depositing uh, at water depths far beneath that which light could possibly penetrate. So these, these fossiliferous organisms, they must have been heterotrophs, they must have been you know, feeding off the water column. So we have things like Charnia masoni that we, we mentioned. It's essentially a filter feeding organism that would have been anchored into the substrate and sessile, sort of just hanging about in the water column and filter feeding as it went. There's similar organisms like it, known as Fractifusus. They're not they're not going anywhere. They're they're all they're all anchored, they're all, you know, in one place and and that's it. And that actually can be a, a benefit and a curse. Um, the benefit is when they get preserved, and they get preserved in a couple of ways, they either get buried by a sediment or slightly cooler, they get, they get buried uh, by ash, by volcanoes at the time, kind of like a, an Ediacaran Pompeii. Mm. Um, and that actually preserves these organisms in situ, in a life assemblage. So we can actually go look at a bedding plane, look at the, one of these stratal layers with all the fossils, and you're seeing it as it was on, on the day it all ceased. And you can really get a great amount of information about ecology, behavior, which organisms liked hanging out next which, to others, which didn't, uh, how they reproduced. You know, there's uh, examples have been shown by some colleagues of mine, a lady, Emily Mitchell, who's also at Cambridge. She's actually in Newfoundland at the moment actually shown that there's lots of smaller uh, frondose organisms or juveniles hanging about next to big ones, you know. So it's this idea that they would have been able to sort of, you know, eject their offspring, if you like, and they were hanging, you know, close to the parents. Um, we also showed that there's actually little filaments that actually connect a lot of these organisms. They might have been living symbiotically with each other. Like we get, we get a huge amount of information from the fact that they were all preserved sort of in situ at, at hmm. one go, at one moment. Um, so Canada can tell us an awful lot. It's completely contrary to somewhere like Australia or Namibia, places where I've been fortunate enough to work. We don't have volcanoes here, um, but also by this time, we're marginally younger. We're about 550 million years old, so about 10 million years um, younger. Suddenly things can move. We've, we've evolved mobility. And there are these fabulous uh, organisms known as Dickinsonia, which kind of look like little dinner plates that would have been sort of lying flat on the surface. And, and they could move. We can see their, their trace fossils, if you like, their traces, as these organisms would have moved from, you know, A to B. Uh, and they leave some absolutely magnificent fossils. But it asks the question, you know, why were they moving? What, what, why did they need to move? Mm. And, um, and the simple answer to that is, to, to get greater access to food. In Canada, you know, we're hanging about in one place in the water column. The only nutrients you're gonna get is what sort of floats on by. Yeah. If you can actually go and get your food, that's a, that's a good life advantage. So in Australia, the rocks are forming in much shallower environments. And this is a lot of the work I've done, but unlike our really deep waters out in Canada, we're sort of, hugging Earth's coastlines in Australia. You know, we're out in the shallow waters, so we have a lot more light, and we have a lot of evidence for, uh, for pervasive microbial mats, essentially thick biofilm covers that would have covered huge expanses of the seafloor at, at the time in the Precambrian. Mm. And, um, and if you're a, an Ediacaran organism, a nice biofilm, you know, pervasive covering of, of microbial mat, that's food. You can go and get that. You can eat that. That's energy. That's fantastic. Um, so possibly this sort of uh, relationship between microbial mats and the organisms that, you know, the organisms depended on the mats. They lived off the mats and they evolved certain traits to sort of better capitalize on that, on that ecosystem.
We've mentioned your recent findings in Australia that have given us new data about Ediacaran animals. So for anyone who hasn't read about this discovery, can you describe what you and your colleagues uncovered? Yeah, so I've been uh, with my colleagues uh, specifically looking at the environments in which these uh, early animals were existing in, uh, in two locations largely in recent years, out in Australia and over in Namibia. Now, the Namibian rocks, they're, they're a little bit younger. Okay, they're right on the Precambrian Cambrian boundary or the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. Australia, we're marginally older and marginally deeper water, or so we mm. thought. What me and my colleagues did was actually show that, uh, that the fossiliferous environments in Australia, which are among the most diverse anywhere on the planet, they're actually occupying very, very shallow waters, still very much marine, but right on Earth's coastlines, you know, in areas where, you know, you might go surfing or swimming. You know, we're talking uh, water depths of just a few metres, uh, you know, not very deep uh, at all. Now, that's interesting in itself because it shows that these early animals, they were equipped to live in these kind of like turbulent surf and swath uh, zones. Because when we go over to Namibia, the Namibian assemblage is the least diverse of any Ediacaran assemblage anywhere in the world. So even the oldest in Canada, they have far greater diversity than Namibia. Australia certainly has far more. As I said, it's the most diverse of any Ediacaran assemblage. Namibia, we're, we're, you know, we've got far less stuff. There's only a couple of different types of fossils. There is, they're evolving cool traits, but there's, there's just not many of them. This was previously put down or thought to be because the Namibian uh, environments were so shallow. They were really turbulent, thought to be very energetic, such that not many things actually evolved the, t the toolkit necessary to, to withstand such an environment. But what we've shown in, in the older rocks in Australia is, is actually they could. You know, we have the, the most diverse Ediacaran macrofossil assemblages, and they're living in water subject to the everyday action of waves, and they don't seem that bothered by it. Occasionally, a big storm comes along and buries them all, kills them off, puts them into the fossil record for people like me to go and go and look at. But on a day to day basis, you know, they're doing on all right. Namibia, that's not the case. You know, we have far less diversity and and they have indications that that, 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 that they're quite stressed. Um, so it, it sort of leads to the interesting prospect of, you know, what ultimately caused the demise of the Ediacaran organisms, um, you know, whereas before we just presumed in Namibia, you know, it was the environmental exclusion of particular types. In actual fact, possibly the Ediacaran macrobiota were already on their way out before the Cambrian explosion, before the turn of the mm. Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. So are there any theories as to what might have caused this demise? Yeah, well, there's there's a few mutually ex exclusive uh, theories. So you know, the jury's still out. You can you can make your own mind up. As I was saying, in Australia, you know, these organisms they were very very dependent on on the microbial mats, the biofilms that they were living off. Um, and whilst you know th this mobility uh, had evolved uh, between you know, those oldest Canadian deposits and these these Australian ones, a newer evolutionary triumph had achieved between Australia and Namibia and that's uh, burrowing or biotubation and it's the act of you know very small invertebrates actually able to sort of come along and churn up sediment sort of you know chomp it up break it apart mix the that sort of top layer of uh, of of the surface of the geology and um and that's great news if you're a, a burrowing invertebrate it's not necessarily great news if you're uh, an ediacaran macrobiota because you depend on that top surface be pristine all right you don't need small invertebrates coming along and chewing it because it's free food for them too but actually mixing that uh, top surface layer because suddenly your source of food is far far less uh, regular it's far more depleted uh, so there's this idea that uh, the evolutionary sort of innovation that took place between the Australian assemblage and the Namibian assemblage, this feat of biotubation actually kick-started, uh, you know, a changing in sediment substrates that basically facilitated the Ediacaran macrobiota's downfall. 
Now that's that's just one idea. Another is that um, that it's not actually an extinction event at all, but actually a change in how fossils might preserve. So the Ediacaran macrofossils, all of them, they're all soft-bodied. They're soft-bodied organisms, much like the Burgess Shale deposits in the Cambrian that we mentioned um, earlier in the show. Um, it takes exceptional preservational sort of conditions to get them at all. It's not going to happen on a daily basis. You know, they're, they're oddities. They're unusual things to happen. Mm. They need some help. And one idea is that the microbial mats, as well as providing a food source, we're also providing the means to preserve your fossils. Essentially, you'd have an organism like Dickinsonia moving around or Charnia just hanging about. They would die, be fouled, or just become static. And then a pervasive microbial mat coating would come along and cover the organism up before it's had a chance to, to decompose. But they would essentially also make it a more anoxic environment and also just protect it. You know, microbial mats, they're pretty hard. If you ever, you know, go down your local salt marsh and, you know, find a little, you know, pool and you can pull one of these things up, they're tough, they're strong. So it's that when the next sort of sedimentation event happened, the next layer of time was sort of deposited, yes. you might bury the microbial mat and the, the fossil it's covering sort of unmodified. So possibly the loss of these uh, these microbial fabrics, these microbial mats, uh, reduce the chances of actually preserving these macrofossils. And whilst we've got you know twenty fossiliferous sites worldwide, it's not that many, you know. So if you suddenly sort of reducing the chance of preserving any macrofossils, you know, once you get into the Cambrian, maybe these organisms are still existing to some extent but the chances of them making it into the record are even, even more minimal. So, you know, there's the one school of thought that the changing environmental conditions led to their demise. The other school of thought is actually it's the, the changing, you know, fossilization process because of evolution is actually reducing the chances of preserving the organisms. Maybe they did creep into the Cambrian. Well, in the same way that the discovery of the Cambrian animal spurred questions as to what came before, we then have to ask, what came before the Ediacaran? Uh, were there even earlier life forms? No, that's a really good question. Whilst us paleontologists would love to, you know, give ourselves a pat on the back and say, oh, you know, the discovery of the Ediacaran macrobiota, we solved Darwin's dilemma. We found those elusive earlier evidence of fossiliferous life that, that he never could. Um, but in much the same way, that a trilobite is a is a very complicated organism. It's fair to say these these Ediacaran fossils that they're, they're also incredibly complex. You know, we have uh, very diverse forms. You know, things that are moving, things that are predating, filter feeding. Some of these frondose organisms are over a meter tall. Uh, they form incredibly complicated ecosystems. They can reproduce. You know, they're by no means simple. So so it does beg the question. Have, have we solved Darwin's dilemma really, or have we just sort of shifted it further back in time? So if we, if, if we consider those older, older time expanses, Earth went through um, a series of very, very important um, shifts. One about one billion years ago, so going way back, we used to have a big supercontinent. So lots of people have heard of Pangaea, which is younger. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a supercontinent that preceded even that one, known as Rodinia. Now, Rodinia rifted apart, uh, you know, about seven, eight hundred million years ago and started creating a lot more sort of shallow oxic uh, waters, which, which life might have a chance of inhabiting or evolving in. Then we had another problem. We had, for sure, some of Earth's most severe ever glaciations. So we now enter a period known as the Cryogenian, which kicks off 750 million years ago. So, you know, we really are pushing back in time now. And this has led to some of, I think, some of the most fantastic sort of conceptually cool theories in all of geology. It's this idea of a snowball earth. That's geologists through a, a decent expanse of time uh, went around the planet and found 
rocks that we could see at the present day would form in glacial environments. You know, if you go to a modern glacier, see the signatures of a rock formed by a modern glacier, and we were finding them in the Precambrian everywhere. Uh, we we're finding them in North America, South America, Europe, Australia, and people spend a lot of time doing paleocontinental reconstructions. And they basically show that these glacial rocks were forming at very low latitudes, you know, as much as, you know, we just have glaciers and Arctic conditions at the poles today in the higher latitudes, these conditions were creeping almost down to the equator. Um, and this led to the, the idea of, of Snowball Earth. Now, there are two proposed Snowball Earth um, episodes, uh, one known as the Marinoan, the other the Sturtian, that, you know, they both last about 10 million years. Now, if you're trying to evolve sort of macroscopic mm. tendencies for the first time in a planet's history, possibly a, you know, a snowball glacial environment isn't the best time to do it. But when we come out of those severe glaciations, uh, you know, we start rising water levels, we start making them more oxic, we start decreasing their salinity. You know, a lot of fresh waters uh, held up in the, in this ice, suddenly we're creating conditions which, which maybe life would have a chance of yeah. evolving into. One possibility is that there are no older fossils than, than the Ediacaran. And actually, you know, we just had accelerated sort of complex diversification at around the time we see the first uh, fossil records. The other is that we did have preceding far simpler organisms that we've just not found yet. Uh, you know, that we haven't been able to go out and, and, and discover. The other option is they were actually living in much, you know, deeper waters that have a, have a lesser chance of being preserved. Um, you, you need to flood your continents with water in order to preserve fossils of any sort. So once you're, once you're melting your glaciers, you're rising your sea level, you're flooding more continental area, and you've actually got marine waters now with a, with a chance of leaving a record. So there's lots of things to weigh up, be it salinity, oxygen. If more paleontologists uh, have the opportunity to get out there, get in the field and know what they're looking for, it's, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that we're going to find even older, simpler fossils. Wow. Well, your work takes you all over the world, but in recent years, the pandemic and other reasons have created a lot of roadblocks for you and your team. So what's ahead for you what upcoming projects are hopefully <laughs> on the horizon oh uh, yeah as for everyone the last the last couple of years has, has been been tough we've had uh, field seasons cancelled in australia that you know we had fully paid up we had others cancelled in namibia uh we've been lucky that we spent a month out in namibia early this year and we forged some fantastic collaborations with some local institutes that it looks likely that we're going to get the opportunity to, to go back next year. In a couple of months, I'll be out in Newfoundland in Canada again with uh, some students of mine, which is fantastic. We can really kickstart their research projects. These are really right now towards this idea of, you know, what, what caused the, the end of the Ediacaran fossils. I'm really interested in trying to suss out the exact environmental changes between our Canadian deposits and our Australian ones and our Namibian ones, and really work out, you know, what gives, what, what changed, what environmental factors might have actually led to their ultimate demise. So, um, so a lot more field work, basically, you know, a, a huge backlog. When, 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 uh, when we're not in the field, we'll, we'll, we'll be bored in the office wishing we we're in the field. So we might yeah. as well just spend as much time on the road as possible. Well, it's been great talking to you, Will, and I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge with us. I will leave links to your social media and research papers in the description below. And all I have to say is thank you very much indeed for coming on to Evolution Soup. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to come on and actually talk about Earth's first life. It's a, it's a thrill for me. So I hope you and all your listeners enjoy. And yeah, please send me any questions you have. 